right, we continue working on conservation laws, and we have started talking about conservation of energy. This will be the first of two videos that focuses primarily on energy, although we won't do exclusively energy. So the first question, a block slides down a surface. Oh, yes, that's intro physics. And it's a sloped surface at an angle of theta. Right? Aren't they all, aren't they all sloped at an angle of theta? Good, that's what it looks like. Angle of theta with respect to the horizontal. It starts at rest at distance d up the slope from the bottom. So when I say d up the slope, that means that distance is d. The coefficient of kinetic friction between the block and the surface is mu sub k. So I'll just write, we've got a mu sub k. We're all happy about that. How fast is the block going when it reaches the bottom? Well, all right. So if there were no, I'm going to do the wrong problem first. If there were no kinetic friction, what we can do is we can figure out that the initial height of the block, and how do I, why don't I do it to the center of mass? Well, if you think about when the block is at the bottom, that's going to be when its front edge reaches the bottom. So I want to use the same reference point. So I use the front edge reference point. So that h, and that also nicely lines up with d, because h over d is sine theta. So we know that h is equal to d sine theta. So we can use conservation of energy. Initial energy is equal to final energy. To do this, we have to make sure that there are no external forces that would break conservation of energy. Well, there are actually external forces in this case. Um, if I draw a free body diagram, there's gravity, and we don't have to worry about that because we're tracking gravity through gravitational potential energy. But this normal force is an external force. But here's the key. The normal force is perpendicular to the direction that it's going to move, always. And so, in this case, and all throughout this move motion is what I'm trying to say, this normal force is perpendicular to the direction of motion. So therefore, it's not, it's not always true that normal forces are perpendicular to motion. Don't, don't think that. But this normal force is perpendicular the whole time it's moving, um, right? Because it's always going to move in that direction. So it does no work. And if the normal force does no work, then it doesn't break conservation of energy. So we've got conservation of energy in this case. I'll have to draw that again momentarily. What's the initial? Well, it's all potential. There is no kinetic energy. So the initial is just mg d sine theta. It's all gravitational potential energy. At the end, there is no gravitational potential energy anymore. So we just have 1 half mv squared. Or we get, we did this in class today, we get v is equal to the square root of 2g d sine theta. But that is not the problem that we're doing. Because there is also kinetic friction there. So I'm going to redraw my force diagram. I have mg, I have a normal force, and I have the friction force. And the friction force clearly is going to do work. So let's see if we can figure out what these forces are. I'm going to break gravity into components. This is angle theta. I know that because this vertical is perpendicular to horizontal. This dotted line here is defined as being perpendicular to the plane. All right. I'm basically defining x and y like this now. So the dotted line is perpendicular to the plane. So what that means is if I, they're both perpendicular, if I rotate them both 90 degrees, I get things that they are perpendicular to. I will get that same angle there. So good. So we know that because it's not moving in my y direction here, that Fn has to equal, in this case, mg, and it's the adjacent angle. So Fn has to equal mg cosine theta. We also know that kinetic friction, F sub f, its magnitude is going to be equal to mu k Fn, which is mu k mg cosine theta. OK. Now, we could just go ahead and solve this by doing the kinematics the way we've done it before, but we're in the energy section. So how do you do this with energy? Well, the initial energy of an object plus the work done on the object is equal to the final energy of the object, assuming that there's no energy losses um, to you know, converting energy to heat or something like that. It turns out that the friction force actually will convert some energy to heat, but that will be through that work. But there's no, heat, there's no heat flow, just directly heat flow or anything like that going on. So then this should account for it correctly. We already know what EI is. EI is MGD sine theta. What is the work done by external forces? So 
Friction is an external force because it's with the plane, and the plane's not part of our system. And we know that work is equal to F dot delta R as long as F is constant throughout the whole delta R. Well, this frictional force, we're going to write it down here. This is constant. That's a constant. That's a constant. That's a constant. Theta is the same the whole way. So the frictional force is constant. As I've written it here, it is mu k mg cosine theta, and it's in the negative x hat direction. And then delta r, what distance is this force acting over? Well, it's going to go a distance d in the x hat direction, and that's a dot product of these two. I don't like the way that looks, so I'm going to redraw it so you can see clearly it's a dot product. So if I have all these things, I can factor out the scalars, I will get minus mu k mg d cosine theta times x hat dot x hat, which is of course just one. So the total work done is minus mu k mg d cosine theta. And that's going to equal EF, which is going to be one half mv squared, because when it's at the bottom, there's no gravitational potential energy, it's all kinetic. I'm going to divide both sides by m again. Um, I'm going to multiply both sides by 2. I will have 2g d sine theta minus 2 mu k g d cosine theta is equal to v squared. I'm going to factor out the stuff that's common, which is 2g d times sine theta minus cosine theta. That's what v squared is equal to. So if I take a square root of both sides, I have the speed at the bottom. So that's how you would do that with energy conservation. Now, the next question is, evaluate this numerically for certain numbers. So let's go ahead and do that. So if we start with um, theta equals 35 degrees, and mu k equals 0.25. Now, I want to point one thing out. I don't tell you the mass of the block. And that's OK, because it doesn't show up in this expression. But when you started, you might say, wait, wait, I can't figure out the frictional force because I don't know the mass of the block. I can't figure out the normal force. I can't figure out the initial energy because I don't know the mass of the block. All these things are true. But I haven't asked you for the initial energy. I haven't asked you for the final kinetic energy. I've asked you for the final speed. We use considerations of energy to figure out a speed. If you do the whole thing symbolically, you discover you never need that M number. Um, so this is why if you have a problem where something's not given that you think you need, give it a name, M, and hope that it drops out by the end. If it doesn't, it means one of two things. Either you've done it wrong, or it means that I didn't give you something you needed. Mm -hmm. In this case, it drops out, so we're good. So we have everything we need because we also know G. Oh, I didn't give you a D. Um, so yes, I will give you a D now. D is equal to 0.75 meters. And of course, G is equal to minus 9.8 meters per second squared. Um, oh, I'm a terrible person. G is not minus 9.8. G is just 9.8 meters per second squared. Oh, I can't believe I did that. Oh, forgive me. Okay, um, what I'm going to do is plug all these numbers in here. So in this case, I get the speed is equal to the square root of 2 times 9.8 meters per second squared. That's 2g times d, 0.75 meters, times sine of 35 degrees, it's a pretty steep slope here, minus 0.25 times cosine of 35 degrees. So if I look at the units here, there's no units in here, meters times meters over second squared is meters squared divided by second squared. Take a square root, I will get something in meters per second. And so let me put these numbers in my calculator. All right, and having put the numbers in my calculator, I get 5.4 meters per second. Very exciting. I don't know what that means, but whatever. Um, now, we want to change it and do for, a, for another set of numbers. I will do that here. This is part C. Evaluate this numerically. Now, theta is 10 degrees in mu k. So theta is 10 degrees. It's not nearly as steep. And mu k, it's a much more, a much rougher surface. So the coefficient of kinetic friction is a lot higher. D is still 0.75 meters. And G is equal to 9.8 meters per second squared as before. So V is now 2 times 9.8 meters per second squared times 0.75 meters times the sine of 10 degrees minus 0.6 times the cosine of 10 degrees, right? 
Let me put those numbers in my calculator. By the way, I just discovered I made an error. This should have been the square root of 5.4, which works out to 2.3 meters per second. Sorry about that. I did the whole number without doing the square root first. So that was fixing part B. Now I'm going to put part C in my calculator. And I get V is equal to the square root of minus 6.133 meters squared per second squared. And now we have a problem. Uh-oh. So what happened? Well, here's what happened. If you go back and you think about forces again, and you look at forces in the x direction, right? so there's the normal force there in the y direction, there's mg in the x direction, and there's mu k f n in the negative x direction, sorry, mg is in both x and y. I know that m times a x, right, so that's x, that's y, is going to equal the net force in the x direction, which is mg sine theta, minus mu k f n, and we know f n is mg cosine theta. If I work out this force, I'm going to get, or this acceleration, well, it's a force divided by mass, it'll be an acceleration. I'm gonna get something less than zero, which tells me kinetic friction is dragging it up. So it never reaches the bottom, but also that doesn't even make sense because kinetic friction always opposes the motion, the relative motion of the two surfaces sliding. So this says in this case, so this is sort of a trick question, part C. It never reaches the bottom. In fact, kinetic friction won't act because the kinetic friction coefficient is so high that in fact static friction will have taken over and this guy won't slide at all. It's not a steep enough slope. So that's what ends up happening in part C. So the most important one is knowing how to work through this in part A. In part B, you plug in numbers. Part C, what happens if you get a number that doesn't make sense, like a square root of a negative number? You have to go back and rethink one of the assumptions you made was wrong. Well, I made the assumption that it will be sliding down. But with this strong of friction, it can't be. Right? That is the first problem. And the second problem, we have the pendulum. The pendulum consists of a lightweight, i.e. massless, or so low mass that it's not going to affect anything, a string that is 75 meters long, sorry, 75 centimeters long. A 75 meter long pendulum would be a really long pendulum. And a bob at the bottom that has a mass of 150 grams. And I'm going to draw it at some angle here. Right, so what I'm saying is this length here is L. L is equal to 0.75 meters. Notice how I converted to meters. Why? Just because I wanted to. I didn't have to, but I did. And M is 150 grams. So M is 0.150 kilograms. If the pendulum is pulled back to an angle of 25 degrees and released, how fast will the bob be moving when it reaches the lowest point of its motion? Now, you might be tempted to do what we've done earlier in this class and use forces. Right, so what we're saying is it's pulled back to 25 degrees and released from rest. And the question is then, when the pendulum reaches, when it reaches that, how fast is it going? That's the question we're asking, right? So it'll start that way and it'll swing and it'll be going at some speed. Now you might say, oh, well, that's easy. I'll figure out the forces on it. Let's start with the free body force diagram. Never a bad idea. So I've got the tension of the string that way, and I've got mg this way, and I can break mg into the mg that's along the direction it's going to move and the stuff that's opposite the tension, because I know that the stuff off the tension, because the string stays at a constant length, this component of gravity has to balance the tension, so I can figure out that component of gravity, use that to calculate the acceleration, and then do something like a... Um, delta V equals A delta T, and be good, right? Here's why that doesn't work. That's when it's here. That's when this angle starts at 25 degrees. Now imagine when the angle is smaller. Now FT is that way, but MG is still this way. I should, I should try and strive to draw the same length. And now that this angle is smaller, the component of gravity along the direction of motion is smaller. So we don't have a constant acceleration here because the force along the direction of motion is not constant. And if F isn't constant, F equals MA, A can't be constant. So this is actually a pretty tricky one to do with forces. 
we will see sort of a way to do it right at the very end of the class. But we have another tool in our toolbox now, and that is energy. So if you think about it, here's the ball when it starts, here's the ball at the bottom. And what we need to do, let's, let's do this to the top of the ball, because that's the length of the string, right? What we need to do is figure out what is that height. And if we can figure out what that height is, right, that height, if I can figure that out, then I'll know how much its potential energy changed, and I can use conservation of energy, which we'll have to think about to make sure it applies. Well, so we have some angle, which I'm going to call theta here. And notice, if I take this off, I have a right triangle here. This is L. So this length here has to be L cosine theta. Well, this whole length is also L. And this length is the same as what we've called H. So H plus L cosine theta has to equal L. Just because this bit of string plus that bit of string must be the whole thing. Or H is equal to L times 1 minus cosine theta. And so now we know the height that it starts at. Let's think about, um, let's think about conservation of energy. I'm going to draw this free body diagram again. We have tension. We have gravity. All right. Tension, well, we're not including the string as part of our system. If we did, then we'd have to worry about the ceiling. Let's just not include the string. So this is an external force. But as we were arguing before, the tension is always, as long if the length stays the same, if the length is not changing, that means the ball is never moving along the length of the string, which means this tension is always perpendicular to the direction of the motion. So the work done by tension, ft dot delta r, for every little delta r, even though the direction of the tension is changing, the direction of motion is always changing, for every little delta r, it's zero. So this force does no work, so it's not going to affect our conservation of energy. We don't have to worry about gravity because we're going to account for it with gravitational potential energy. So energy is conserved. I can say EI is equal to EF. Or MG, and then the height it starts at is L times 1 minus cosine theta. I'm defining my zero height as the bottom here. So that's the energy it starts at, and it starts with no kinetic energy equals the potential energy at the bottom. So I've defined this as to be the height equals zero. With the MGH, you get to pick where height zero is. Um, and just as long as you stay consistent, things are good. Plus 1 half mv squared, where v is the speed it's going at the bottom. And now I can solve this. In fact, I will get 2 times mgl times 1 minus cosine theta. That square root is what v is going to be when it's at the bottom. So that wasn't so bad to figure out. It would have been much more complicated to figure out with forces. And in fact, you couldn't have done it without calculus and doing an integral. And it would have been fairly painful. This not so bad once you see doing the geometry. So drawing your geometry out very carefully, making sure you know what's a right triangle and what is really L and what is really L to make it all work right is the key to getting this one. Making sure there's no external forces doing work. And then you can just use conservation of energy. So that is the second problem. The third question is another pendulum thing, but this time it is a ballistic pendulum. So the way this works is you have a wooden block or something like that of mass capital M, and you shoot into it a bullet at some unknown speed. So this is what we want to find, is that M, or that V, and it's coming in with little m. The bullet ends up lodged in the block. And then after the bullet is lodged into the block, the pendulum, because it got hit by the bullet, will swing up to some angle, which we will call theta. So there's a bullet lodged in the block now. And by measuring this theta, you can figure out this V. And this problem is to say, how, how does this work? Well, OK, so there's actually two things we have to do here. First, we have to consider the collision of the bullet in the block. So let's start with that. Here's the before. So we have an M, we have a little V, we have a little M, a little short bullet there. That's the before, and here is the after, and it's just immediately after. So it hasn't started swinging up yet. This will be going some new V I'll call VF. And now this is a thing that has mass big M plus little m. All right. So this is before. This is after. 
And now we have to think about what is conserved in this collision. Now, I didn't yet talk about this in class today. I will talk about this in class on Friday. Um, there are different types of collisions that we classify them based on whether or not mechanical energy is conserved in that collision. And it will turn out whenever two things come together and stick, and you know, join, or if you have one thing that splits apart into multiple things, um, kinetic energy will not be conserved in that collision. You can actually easily see this if you go in the frame of reference of a big thing that comes apart into two things flying apart. Here, there is kinetic energy because one half mv, m over 2 v squared plus one half m over 2 v squared is going to give you some non-zero kinetic energy, but clearly at zero kinetic energy here. So kinetic energy is not conserved in this. So if I run it the other way around, two things come together and stick, kinetic energy will not be conserved. So we can't use conservation of energy here. Where does the energy go? I mean, energy is conserved. Where does it go? Into heat, mostly. What's going to happen is as the um, bullet and the block interact with each other, there's a frictional force between them that converts mechanical energy into heat and the block gets warmer as a result of that collision. So yeah, so we could figure out how much warmer it gets if we talked about heat capacities and specific heats and stuff like that, try to conserve energy, but that's not going to help us figure out VF. But we know another thing. Um, we know in this case that there are no external forces in the x direction. Let's go ahead and define x that way and y that way. The only external forces we have are gravity, which is acting on both the bullet and the block, and the tension, which momentarily here is entirely vertical. Now, after it hits, it's going to start swinging up, and like here, the tension is no longer entirely vertical. But if we do momentary isolation, just before and just after this collision, tension is vertical. So that's all in the y direction. So momentum won't be conserved in y, but in the x direction it will be. So I can say for this collision, pi is going to equal pf. And pi in this case, and we're just going to do the x component. So pi in this case is minus mv. And pf in this case is minus m plus m vf, right? So v is the speed of the bullet. And because I've defined x that way, the x component of the speed is minus mv. So I can figure out that vf is just equal to little m over big M plus little m times v. All right, so now I know the speed that it's moving at. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to consider the second half of this collision, which is but it's not a collision anymore, the second half of this problem. Going from there, I should have started a little lower, right, to make it look right. No, it's probably too low, but whatever. Going from here to there, as it swings up, momentum will not be conserved, because there's not it's not a short delta T, it's going to take some time to swing up. And during that time it swings up, the angle of the tension is going to be changing. Eventually tension will be in both X and Y. So we have no momentum conservation that we can deal with. In fact, if you just think about it, in the x direction it starts moving, and it, as high as it gets, that's when it stops moving. Clearly, all of the x momentum has been taken out of the block. So therefore, the impulse, which all comes from the tension, the impulse in the x direction from the tension is significant during that time. So we do not have momentum conservation during this time. But we do have energy conservation. Why? Because the length of this, um, the length of this, string, thank you, of the cord holding up the block is constant, which means that the block's never moving along that string. So the force of tension is always perpendicular to the direction the block moves. So once again, we had this in the last problem, the work done by tension is the force of the tension dotted with delta R. So for each little bit of this movement, it's going to start moving horizontally, tensions vertically. It'll move it some angle like that, tensions like that. It's always perpendicular. And remember, the dot product of two perpendicular vectors is always zero. So tension doesn't break energy conservation. Gravity we can account for with gravitational potential energy. So now this works out very much like the last problem, where we want to figure out what is the height that he goes to, right? So this is the height that he's going to go to compared to what he started at. Well, that's L. So this, that's adjacent over hypotenuse, so that has to be L cosine theta, so that when I divide it by L, I get cosine theta. Um, and also this whole thing is L, because that's the string again, so just like last time, H is equal to L minus L cosine theta, which I prefer to write as 1 minus L times 1 minus cosine theta. So that's the height it will get to. 
And so now I can do conservation of energy between here, which is the end of the collision, so from here to here. So it starts at the bottom. It has, let's go ahead and define when you're here to have no work, whatever, we could do it differently. But yeah, you know what I'm gonna do, just to make it, just to mix things up a little bit. I'm gonna define it over the floor. And I'm gonna say that this height here is capital H. That's how high it is above the floor. So the initial potential energy is just equal to the mass of the whole thing, which is m plus little m, right? Because it's the mass of the whole thing times g times the whole height, which is h plus h. And then, and there's no kinetic, oh, sorry. It's g times capital H. And the kinetic energy is plus 1 half m plus m times v squared. And this is the v, I'll call it vf, because that's the one we're talking about, is this v. I know I'm using vf for an initial thing, but it was the final of the previous step. So I use that, and then when it's as high as it's going to get, the potential energy is m plus m times g times h plus capital H, because it's this much, it's little h higher now, and there's no kinetic energy at the end. Okay, and so now what I just need to do is um, solve this for vf, and I'll get it in terms of theta, assuming I'm able to measure the rest, right? I can weigh the bullet, figure out its mass. Weigh the block, figure out its mass. I know the length of the string is L. I know G. Um, so if I, and so I get theta. I know theta, I can measure theta here. So then I can find VF. So the first thing I'm gonna do is notice here, I'm just gonna do the algebra in a few steps. I have M plus M times G times H plus one half M plus M, and I'm not gonna substitute VF yet, VF squared is. What I'm gonna do is distribute M plus MG into here. So I have M plus M G H plus M plus M G H. And notice the capital H subtracts out from both sides. So we don't have to know this capital H. That's why I could have just defined um, height zero, put zero potential energy to be here. I didn't, and it's fine, but what ends up happening is that the difference on both sides, the added potential energy on both sides ends up just subtracting out. So good. So now I can say that um, Vf squared is equal to, and what's the thing after? That's the thing I am after. No, little v is what I'm after. So I'm going to go ahead and substitute in for little v. I'm going to do two things at once. First of all, the right side, I'm going to multiply by 2 times g from this g, and then I'll have to put in h, and I'm going to go ahead and put that in as l times 1 minus cosine theta. And then I have to divide both sides by m plus m. Well, there's an m plus n here and an m plus m there, so it goes away. And then on the left side, I have vf squared. Well, that's what vf, I'm going to put that in here. So I have to square the whole thing, plus m squared times v, and this v is the thing that I want to find. OK, so knowing that, again, as usual, horrible board management. So I'm going to go from here up to here. Multiply both sides by the stuff multiplying v, and I will be done. I made an error. This should have been v squared, right? Because vf was squared, and that should have been squared. So I will get v squared is equal to m plus little m squared divided by little m squared times 2gl times 1 minus cosine theta. Well, horrible board management. Or take the square root of both sides, v is equal to m plus m over little m times the square root of 2gl times 1 minus cosine theta. And now, this is how it works. I can measure the big M. I can measure the little m. So that's known, that's known, that's known. G I know. I can measure the L. And then I measure the theta. When all is said and done, now I can figure out what this V was. And so this is something that's actually really been used to figure out um, uh, muzzle speeds of bullets. You know, they move so fast, it's going to be really hard to do it by, you know, a stopwatch or even the kind of motion sensors you use in lab, although nowadays you can do it with that sort of thing. Um, but you just shoot it into this and you use conservation of momentum and energy, not at one time, but for the two different steps of the problem. So that's the key is recognizing that you have to break it down into pieces. Do this first piece. Do this second piece. Don't worry about the fact that energy is not conserved in this collision. Then don't worry about the fact that momentum is not conserved here. Momentum is conserved for the collision. 
mechanical energy is conserved while it's rising. So that is the third problem. That's how it all works out. Cataclysm. The Earth is suddenly stopped in its orbit around the Sun. So here's the Sun. And here is the Earth. And the Earth is suddenly stopped in its orbit around the Sun. It will fall towards the Sun. How fast will it be going when it hits the surface of the Sun? So there's some numbers we're going to need here. We will need the fact that the mass of the Earth is equal to, I better look this up to make sure I got it right. Yes, 5.972 times 10 to the, actually it turns out we don't need this at all. But I'll write it down anyway. The mass of the Sun is 1.99 times 10 to the 30 kilograms. The Sun is much more massive. And then finally, the radius of the Sun, which is that thing there, is equal to, I just looked it up and it didn't stick in my head, 696300 kilometers. Right, so that's 6.963 times 1, 2, 3, 4 times 10 to the 5th, so that's 6.963 times 10 to the 8th meters, because there's 1,000 meters in a kilometer. We will need those numbers. Now, if you think about what happens to the Earth, we could say, good, okay, here's the Earth, right, here's continents and stuff. There's a force on the Earth that way, and the magnitude of that force is going to be big G times mass of the Earth times mass of the Sun. I said that backwards divided by the distance between them. So, oh, now we need more numbers. What is the initial distance between them? That's 1.496 times 10 to the 11th meters, also called an astronomical unit. And what is big G? G equals 6.674 times 10 to the minus, well, I better check that. Yeah, that's right, I should have doubted myself. So, all right, these are all the numbers we're gonna need. Here's the force. You will be tempted to say, okay, so I can figure out the magnitude of the acceleration from this, and then I can say that delta V is going to equal uh, A delta T, but I don't know A, so what I'm going to say is that delta R, which is going to be R, is equal to um, V delta T, all right? Uh, figure out the V from this, plug it in here, and this will all be wrong. All of this will be wrong, except for this part. Why? Because A is not constant. How do I know that? Because this distance is in here. And when the Earth is going to say halfway in, when R is half the size, this force will be, I lied to you, this force should have had an R squared. So when Earth has gone halfway in, the force will be four times as big. So the acceleration will be four times as big. So A isn't constant. So this delta V equals A delta T. The delta T we're talking about is too long. And also it's accelerating, so the V isn't constant. So that doesn't work either. So we could use F equals MA, but the A is constantly changing, and so we're going to have to break it up into a whole bunch of little delta T's and work out how long it takes. And you could do that, but you would either have to use calculus or do it on a computer to work out, uh, to do all those little, little, little tiny delta T's. I and mean, you could do it by hand, but it would be really long, and computers could do that fast. But we have another thing we can use, and that is the system is the Earth and the Sun and nothing else. So this is an isolated system. We know that the initial energy of this system is minus G, mass of the sun, mass of the earth, divided by R, because that is the gravitational potential energy. We know that the final gravitational potential energy of the system is minus G, mass of the sun, mass of the earth, divided by radius of the sun, right, because that's where the earth is. At the end, it'll be right at the radius of the sun, plus, one half times mass of the Earth times V squared, and this V is the thing we want. And we know there are no external forces, so it's an isolated system. So I can say EI is equal to EF. So that means that minus G, mass of the Sun, mass of the Earth, divided by R, should equal minus G, mass of the Sun, mass of the Earth, divided by radius of the Sun, plus one half mass of the Earth, V squared. Now this is one where you will be tempted to do algebra wrong, so be very careful. There's a mass of the Earth in every term, so I can divide by mass of the Earth. I'm going to add this to the other side, and I will have G mass of the Sun over R Sun. Right, that's what I get from adding this to both sides, minus 
g mass of the sun over little r is equal to one half v squared. I'm going to factor out the g mass of the sun. Um, don't fall into the trap of saying it's g times mass of the sun divided by r sun divided by minus r. That would be wrong. That would be bad algebra. So I'm going to factor out. I'm also going to multiply both sides by 2, so I get v squared by itself. I have 2g mass of the sun times 1 over radius of the sun minus 1 over the initial distance. Um, that, well, if I put a square root over the whole thing, that is going to equal v. So I multiplied both sides by 2, factored out the gm sun, and then took a square root. So now I can plug the numbers in. So what I'm going to do is do that over here. So if I put these numbers in, I will get the speed that the Earth is going when it crashes into the sun's surface and vaporizes, making all of us die horribly, although we would have died before getting closer to the sun, 2 times 6.674 times 10 to the minus 11th meters cubed per kilogram second squared. I want you to notice, when I'm plugging in numbers, I write down the units on those numbers. Many of you don't do that. Please do. And, and that's because, first of all, it's just wrong if you don't. That should be good enough reason. But there's also a good reason to do it. And I'll show you what that is in a moment. So it's kilograms um, times. And now I'm going to erase this so I have more space to work with times 1 over the radius of the sun. Oh, no! I kind of erased it there, but I can see what it is. 6.963 times 10 to the 8th meters minus 1 over 1.496 times 10 to the 11th meters. All right. So remember, because it's in parentheses, I do that first. That's going to equal V. Now, here's the thing about the units. Let's make sure the units work right. Well, I have kilograms both in the top and the bottom, so that's good. Here, when I subtract these two numbers, I will have some number that is 1 over meters, and I have meters cubed. So what that's going to happen, this meters will cancel one of those, and that will become meters squared. I have meters squared divided by seconds squared. When I take the square root, that becomes meters per second. So I am going to get an answer in meters per second like I want. That's good. And now I just put all these numbers in my calculator. All right, and 6.16 times 10 to the 5 meters per second. Or if I divide this by 10 to the 3, I get about 600 and so I'm going to round it to just two sig figs. Because I had three. No, I think I have three. Uh, 600, I think, I'm not sure I got this right to three sig figs, but whatever. Uh, 616 kilometers per second. Right? That's in contrast to about 30 kilometers per second that it's going in its orbit around the sun. So we'd be tooling along at 616 kilometers per second and plow into the sun and vaporize and become sad. Anyway, so that was just an example of using conservation of energy where we're using the GMM over R energy expression, remembering that it's negative. It right? had that negative sign and that negative sign and making sure you do the algebra right here. That's it for this week.